All right. Well, hello, everyone. I, I should say good afternoon since it's one o'clock. Um, welcome to Goucher Environmental Dialogues. Um, in case this is your first time joining us, uh, I am Dr. Jen DeRosa. I'm the director of our Master's in Environmental Sustainability and Management program here at Goucher College. And the Goucher Environmental Dialogues, this is a web-based speaker series. We like to feature cultivated conversations uh, with environmental sustainability and climate leaders and visionaries and innovators. And um, as I mentioned, this program is hosted by our master's degree in environmental sustainability and management. If you guys have any questions about our uh, master's degree or any other webinars that we are offering um, later in the summer and even into the fall, I will share a link in just a little bit um, so how you can access all of those resources. Also, all of our previous webinars have been recorded and are on our YouTube channel, so you can always go back and binge watch them if you really want to. Um, so um, I'll share that link in just a moment. Our conversation today is about urban wild songbirds, their habitats, and the challenges they face um, when they're exposed to pollution in the environment. Our guest is Goucher College visiting professor, Dr. Ohad Paris. And Ohad completed his doctorate in ecology at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, where he studied the effects of urbanization on reproduction and behavior of songbirds. And he completed his master's degree in biology at the College of William and Mary. He studied the effects of mercury exposure on the reproduction of songbirds. And before his undergraduate degree at the University of Florida as well. His teaching and research interests include avian behavior, ecology, statistical methods in ecology, spatial analysis of vegetated habitats and using LIDAR data, and forest ecology. So I know, uh, just a note that we are a webinar format, so you can't turn your um, cameras and audio on, but we can use the chat. So if you would like to join me in the chat and welcome Ohad, you can indicate in the chat where you're logging in from. And also, if you have any questions for Ohad um, during our conversation today, you can always type your question in the chat and I will give voice to that um, sometime in the middle or the end of our of our talk today. So thank you and welcome Ohad. I'm so glad thank you. you can join us. Great to be here. Thank you for everybody who's joining. Yeah, yeah, and it's, uh, it's pretty hot outside, but uh, I know that in the summertime, I know many of us have been spending some time outdoors enjoying nature and also noticing a lot of our birds. And I always like to ask whenever I have a guest, um, if if you could tell me a little bit more about your your background in terms of what led you to a career in songbird ecology. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's not one thing. Um and I think uh, the best way to explain it is to start uh, from my childhood. And you know what? I'm pretty sure that applies to many ornithologists. Uh, I uh, grew up in an area that um, was uh, rich in, in, uh, in bird diversity, uh, anything from raptors, uh, eagles, hawks, uh, buzzards, what we call in the old world. Uh, in, in Europe um, and Asia. Uh, here we just call them hawks. Um, rich in songbirds, uh, many of which we, we do not have here in the United States. I grew up in Northern Israel and the area was uh, quite rural up until recently. And all this wildlife um, and hills full of flowers in, in the spring and uh, uh, throughout the fall. Uh, and I got to connect to the, these animals by observing them, by observing their behavior, watching, for example, kestrels uh, catch uh, large beetles and dissect them in the same place every time and feeding their young or, or standing uh, two hours before sunset in a particular place to see uh, the hawks moving through and almost hitting me in the head. Um, to watch uh, the the goldfinches uh, fly between brambles there in the fields, um, to watch the uh, uh, species called little owls, which are these small owls with the big eyes that live in in, in these little communities, 
uh, and connect to them and then to see how urban development very slowly and very steadily just just uh, brings our population down and with some of those species like the little owl completely removing them from the area so that sense of almost like owing them something um uh and uh, a real uh, just as um something i guess scientists don't like talking about but uh, the um sentimental uh uh appreciation for them is something that drew me always to to nature and to birds in particular uh so th there's that entire thing and us scientists we don't like to mention how we're sentimental but uh it's kind of like give me a break a big reason you're doing this is not only because you want to i don't know publish and 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 uh and um discover something new it's also because you you have a drive that's maybe a little a little um uh, more emotional behind it uh and then uh there's similar things i mean we we um i like attributing it to uh to um the first in the series of movies uh, jurassic park it came out in in the early 90s and it was uh so clearly uh both uh, uh a good representation of dinosaurs and absolutely wrong but one thing that was clear is that the it, it you could look at those at the velociraptor and just see essentially a bird without feathers um if that's me saying we always dream of it connecting with dinosaurs in some way or seeing them well you know in many ways they're they're just all around us and there's something really uh fascinating for me about birds and their evolutionary uh lineage that's another one of those kind of maybe less rational reasons to connect to birds uh but I've always um, wanted to have the opportunity to uh, to have a job that, uh, uh, to say it a little jokingly, but pays me to be outside and and connect with these animals and study them and discover new things. Um, and uh, it it it's it's too good to say no to. So um, that that is really what drove me to pursue a career in ecology and um, really the center part of this is just to have the opportunity to um, uh, to maybe improve or conserve these species while being out there and still connecting with them and learning about them and kind of uh, demystifying maybe some of these um, uh, species that we just don't, don't know uh, much about or not enough about. So mm -hmm. that is that. Yeah. Yeah. I think I thank you. Thank you for the 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 background because I can tell you're very passionate about birds and the way you speak about um, your exposure to them growing up and in your surroundings. And I I I found it a little funny though. Jurassic Park influenced me in a different way. I saw that the first movie and I remember falling in love with geology <laughs> yeah. and and not so much uh, birds. I mean I I always enjoyed birds, but. I became a, a bit of a rock and fossil nut after that. Um, oh, I get it. So <laughs> I have a passion for that too. Yeah. Just not the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Um, I think many, many of us, um, many of the folks joining us today, uh, they must also love birds because that's one of the reasons why they were attracted to our, our webinar talk today. Um, we see songbirds in the environment. I know I see them in, in and around my house. I see them on campus. Um, but can you can you explain for our broader audience who maybe is not coming from that ecology background, why are songbirds so important when it comes to ecosystems and the environment? Yes, uh, thanks for the question. And and uh, I wanted to mention, by the way, uh, if I mention any specific uh, species, uh, I, I encourage you to just even just Google or Wikipedia, or whatever it is, just the species I mentioned, like the little owl. Uh, just to get an idea of how they look, and and um, uh, maybe you want to continue reading about them later. So um, yeah, this is very verbal, but if you want to actually see see a picture, you can very easily just uh, just Google it. Um, and uh, yeah, so why they're important for our ecosystems? So so when we think about ecosystems, uh, we a lot of times we there's two ways almost like of of um, of thinking of their importance there's thinking of the of the ecosystem we we want ecosystems we want biodiversity to to keep existing and we want to have nature out there uh and and we also want those ecosystems to serve us and to serve 
uh, maybe a, a more uh, just a specific human causes like we want to have clean water and clean air and, and not be overrun by insects, for example. So we'll take those two things together. Songbirds, um, and and there's a lot of diversity. But if I if I will generalize, they uh, are om omnivorous, so they will eat insects. They will also eat uh, small fruit and berries. Uh, some of them eat uh, uh, seeds of grasses and so forth. And we could probably uh, j just knowing that we know that. You, you can probably very easily make the, the correct assumption that they control the population of insects. Okay, they're a part of that system. They control and therefore they bring balance and they will um, get resources and benefits from plants while uh, also uh, distributing their, um, their seeds and pollinating. And, um, and those are really, uh, the two kind of more intuitive ways that songbirds simply hold the ecosystem together by being a part of it. You can't just remove uh, that kind of just important link from an ecosystem. So it's holding that together. And if an ecosystem, take any ecosystem, uh, but um, uh, those ecosystems have benefits to us humans. Uh, some of them, uh, you know, uh, we, we don't want in, uh, insects to overrun our agricultural fields or just the area uh, around us. But by having uh, also the ecosystem working, it can do what it does, like uh, clean our water, uh, like um, uh, maybe provide us with, uh, with benefits like uh, clean air. Maybe some of these benefits are even uh, less um, practical simply by the ecosystem working and having the trees there and the plants there. We can actually enjoy a verdant environment around us. Uh, and more than that, uh, something maybe we that's um, uh, we tend to forget as 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 much as I like and we, we like birds, they also are prey species for other organisms that are again a part of the ecosystem and bring it balanced. So a big thing I studied is uh, nest predation. That is, predators consuming. Uh, nests, whether it's eggs or nestlings. Um, these predators are anything from snakes to foxes. And uh, as predators, those animals keep the overall ecosystem under check. So that's another important role songbirds uh, take in the ecosystem. And it's maybe one we forget about or don't want to think about, but they are also uh, prey items. Um, yeah, and and I will shift the question a little bit and just mention ecosystem services, which mm -hmm. obviously overlaps with what I said already, but ecosystem services are really those things in, that the ecosystem provides us humans. Okay, it's a little self-serving. And one thing with songbirds that maybe is obvious um, to some of us is this, again, this sentimental psychological service they provide us. And you can go down a very interesting wormhole, wormhole hole here that's not my expertise, but evolutionary um, biology or evolutionary ecology, uh, but uh, or evolutionary psychology, I should, I should specify. Why is it that we derive so much um, satisfaction by observing wildlife and specifically birds? Uh, why is it that we enjoy uh, many uh, bird songs? obviously not the crow's call, but generally uh, a lot of the songs we find pleasant, which is odd. And again, not my expertise, but there's something here to think about. What is it that the birds are providing us? And uh, the, the, the science on this seems to be overwhelmingly um, uh, positive uh, or, or conclusive as to say they definitely do contribute to our psychological well-being. If I had to venture and guess, um, I would say that birds signify a productive ecosystem. If we don't have songbirds around, maybe maybe something is not working out. Maybe we're in an area that's not productive enough for us to to uh, um, sustain ourselves and to persist in. Um, and 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 songbirds, just like uh, greenery, just like water, 
they signal to us that this is a beautiful uh, pla place or, or the, the beauty signifies to us in some way, potentially, that um, we can uh, settle there and extract resources from the land um, and and sustain ourselves there. So that's a one one way to potentially think about it in, in a deeper in a deeper sense. Yeah. I appreciate that. I'm thinking of some of the psychology um, apps that I've seen where we, to help you relax. And there's almost always some sort of like bird song sound to to help you you know relax. And you and you're right from like an environmental psychology perspective. For whatever reason, that the human brain tends to associate that with um, with balance and yeah, and, and, and peace. Nature. And, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. It, it's a very interesting thing, and uh, we can hear also even uh, in in the musicology in the human kind of um, uh, expression through music themes that seem to and these are very technical aspects of melodies. Again, not my expertise, even though I, I do. Some people would call me a musician, but uh, they uh, they we do see elements that overlap with how birds sing, and that ha that makes you wonder. Mm -hmm. So there's that entire ecological services aspect to it that's much harder to, to quantify or speak about with confidence, but it does seem to at the same time also be undeniably important. The sentimental psychological uh, mm -hmm. benefit, yeah, yeah, and. From a gardener perspective, I appreciate how they scatter the seeds and <laughs> for those beautiful flowering plants that I so love. Um, I was going to ask, so circling back to when you mentioned growing up and how you had lots of songbirds around and birds around, and then over time you noticed as the, as the urban landscape sort of developed, there was less of those birds. So to, to what extent is the urban landscape or, or human development affecting songbirds yeah and, and um this is this is a big big topic that's been studied for for many years uh the uh i, I was wondering i, I knew we were going to ask this i was wondering how, how to approach it because we're living currently in the world uh where we are um we're so especially in some areas of it so far away from uh the pristine kind of before humans stage where we can say oh things were um uh this is the, the that was the ideal diversity of of um of wildlife or songbirds that we need to get back to um so how does urban or uh, in general, the development of land affecting species simply in a simple sense by uh, by changing the conditions that these animals depend on to to uh, keep persisting in the landscape, we are affecting how likely um, they are to to persist over time. And uh, probably some of on uh, uh, to discuss this clearly, we, we probably have to think about it uh, through uh, a specific example. Now, uh, we can take uh, the ecosystem we have generally in this region, uh, so this kind of Piedmont forest, this area that was um, in the past, in the far past, uh, almost entirely forest, uh, until you get close, closer to the to the uh, coast, where obviously that changes, and we see a history, uh, even before um, uh, colonial times, we see a history where humans are uh, cutting down forest and creating openings in the forest. So obviously, birds that depend on mature uh, forests won't be able to. Um, um, won't be able to be as successful in areas that are dominated less by forest in areas where the forest was removed. Um, now, from our perspective, uh, uh, if, if, we, if we go all the, way, all the way to the present right now, what we're seeing is an area that used to be very forested is essentially, in our 
urban area or Baltimore and the suburbs is chopped up. Okay, there's the forest, there are forest patches, uh, but be, but the forest patches are embedded almost like within an area that uh, was previously forest, previously forest and now is modified. And in that area that's modified, we have buildings, we have agriculture, we have maybe forest that's regenerating, maybe we have agricultural area that was abandoned and and is now changing into something else. We have a parking lot, an abandoned lot, and clearly birds, forest birds, forest songbirds that uh, do best and compete the best in areas with tall forests won't be able to outcompete or do very well in areas where, uh, where it's just an abandoned lot, for example. So what we're seeing is some species being uh, disadvantaged while others are being advantaged and we'll we'll talk about the northern cardinal soon uh, and, and whether it's advantaged or not by the removal of forest uh, that's one way of looking at it but also what is replacing that forest is it a bunch of shrubs is it grass is it is it just um, a bunch of concrete is it buildings so we're seeing these dynamics where some species are contracting in the amount of their population Others are growing, expanding their range. Um, but when we think of the overall diversity of species across the larger landscape, we are seeing over time uh, uh, um, less and less diversity because we do get species that are eventually so disadvantaged that they might um, go extinct and then we you know we don't get them back uh so it's a complex and and a kind of a um it's a dynamic that depends on uh on the the situation that you're looking at but we're talking about species contracting in range and in size and we're really trying to prevent species from going extinct and you know when species go extinct we see a decline i'll do it from this, mm -hmm. We see a decline, and then in many cases, just a complete drop mm -hmm. suddenly like that, or a drop to a, 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 a severe drop to a new level that's so, um, the population is so low that we have a lot of um, anxiety, uncertainty about their future. And we're trying to, to address these issues before we get those severe uh, declines, um, and obviously before uh, we get to extinction. Um, and then you add to that issues of climate change and what that entails. And, you know, the, the future for many species is uncertain. Yeah. I, I think your, your visual there of uh, how the landscape has basically gotten cho chopped up and fragmented. Fragmented, yes. Yeah. It, it makes me think of like when you're in an airplane and you're flying over uh, a city in the surrounding suburbs um, and Perhaps someone will be doing that later this summer, flying into BWI Airport. Yeah. And you look out the window and you'll notice you can see that patchwork quilt of, of your right, parking lot, road, um, abandoned lot, new development, um, agriculture area. Yeah. And, and well, it's quite fascinating when you're in the window seat, um, just thinking of the impacts on birds when it did not used to be like that when you go back in time and you kind of think of what it used to be. Yeah, yeah, and I'll add to that that birds, you know, a canary in the coal mine, obviously is a specific example of that of that chemistry. But uh, mm -hmm. in that case, but but the idea is 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 the same. When we're seeing a species declining, it could be for many reasons. And one of my job, uh, one of the parts of my job, is to figure out maybe what is the reason. But it could be that the bird is perfectly fine in that environment, but some other species it depends on are not. Mm -hmm. So uh, being a bellwether. Uh, of the actual conditions on on the ground is something we also it's a, a major reason we study birds um yeah and i don't want to say also something uh something else yeah uh and and you know when you look from the plane and you're saying oh, okay that's agriculture uh that's a parking lot that's forest uh it looks like forest but is it functioning like uh like some pristine forest or whatever image we have of some ideal uh, environment that will support all this biodiversity there's no guarantee for that the fact that it has uh 
it, it, the look of a forest. You know, it's maybe it has uh, it's it's dark green all around, and inside it's it's uh, there's less light because all the trees captured and all that. We we know as much as we, we can know uh, that when a forest patch is small enough, it stops functioning. Mm -hmm. Uh, or, or the functionality or, or the kind of ecosystem services it might provide are are essentially almost entirely negated. And there's many reasons for that. And I, I, I do um, talk with my students in um, Intro to Environmental Sciences course about these aspects, and some of them can be quite um, um, quite intricate. But uh, yeah, there's no there's no real guarantee. A forest patch you know, doesn't uh, necessarily stand on its own and uh, is not necessarily able to provide all the benefits we want it to when it's, uh, when it's too small. Um, that's a good point, a, yeah. yeah. And, and one more thing to mention, not long ago, I, I went to Cancun for a short vacation, and for the first time in my life, I was able to look out of a plane from, I don't know, it was 10, uh, it was 10 or 20,000 feet as it was going down, and actually see forest all the way to the horizon. Uh, I've never seen that in my life, but that used to be common in many areas that could support vegetation. Uh, that is not not deserts. Um, and yeah, we really don't get to see much of that anymore. But that, for many areas around the world, temperate areas, that, that, that used to be the case. We, you have just areas of forest with very few interruptions for many, many miles and over entire regions. Um, and uh, so, and it's so we changed the earth so much that that we can't even appreciate that and what it would mean. We lost so many species that some of the species we lost, I have to assume, it seems quite compelling to assume, have been lost before they were ever documented. Oh um, yeah, yeah, that's a good because point. Because the the loss was, I wouldn't say prehistorical, but it was, um, in some cases, it was, but it was um, in areas or or didn't survive um the whatever changes in civilization that we're able to move that knowledge on so um uh yeah we're already looking we're we are already in the stage it's in many cases hard for us to imagine how it looked in the past yeah yeah that's a that's a very good point in terms of there's not that many places left where you can find kind of forest for miles and miles especially not in the baltimore region and i want to i want to particularly ask you um since i know you studied the uh the northern cardinal in and around baltimore can you summarize what you did in your work and what you found yeah i'll, I'll try to do it quickly i'm seeing that uh time is short um yeah so i studied uh the northern cardinals uh ability to essentially produce a, a produce young for them to have a successful nest. One thing we know about songbirds, that when we look at nests that fail, almost all those nests, so over 95%, if you do the, the math, the failure is due to uh, a predator. Mm -hmm. um, so if you study nests that, uh, if you simply look at nest outcomes, it gives you a very strong proxy for uh, where predators do their, their work. So I studied that. Um, and uh, I, f I found out that in certain conditions in urban areas, in these forests, in these urban uh, forest patches, cardinals uh, tend to succeed more. Uh, and in other areas of the patch, not so much. And those parameters that support nest success or essentially uh, reduce the likelihood, the probability of being uh, uh, preyed upon have to do uh, with the proximity to the patch edge where the forest ends essentially okay and also uh vegetation uh density and complexity it can't be too even also um mm -hmm. so that's really to summarize it as briefly as possible and i and the way dissertations work uh it has different uh chapters that follow after the first then the second chapter we also found uh that that uh cardinals Generally, it looks overall, they do make good decisions. They try to extract, they try to place their nest as best as they can on average uh, in, in the place that would give them the best chance of succeeding. Mm -hmm. But it looks like there are fewer and fewer areas in the forest patch that they can't succeed because these birds are territorial and there's only so much, so many territories you can fit 
in actually good um, uh, beneficial places in the forest. That was the second chapter. In the third chapter, I looked at the behavior of female cardinals, and uh, they um, they seem to be able to uh, um, show different um, behaviors or, or, or express different behaviors based on the amount of risk um, uh, in the location where they place their nest. Um, so in areas that are more uh, dangerous, specifically mm -hmm. in areas with more uh, snakes and uh, more, um, well, all predators really, uh, they will be a little more um, defensive, let's say, or more aggressive and, and proactive with their uh, defense. Um, and in areas that are that are uh, that are safer, they just face a different conditions altogether uh, that allow them to uh, reduce uh, that, that seem to imply that they can uh, allow themselves to be less aggressive and take less risk because they uh, are, are, are simply uh, it's not worth it because they're more likely to succeed. So they don't have to be in this rage all the time, be ready to, to defend everything because that because that, that, that takes, you know, takes energy. Yeah. I imagine it does. You had mentioned that how close they were to the edge of that yeah. fragmented forest uh, mattered. Was it, did they do better further from the edge or closer yes. to the edge? Yeah, further yeah. From the edge. Okay. yeah, I didn't mention the directionality of that. Yeah, uh, the, the edge or, or the perimeter of the site, essentially, the closer you are to it, the more danger you're in. Uh, and uh, that's an interesting effect that's quite consistent across studies. Uh, and, and when you move deeper into the forest, you are generally more more safe. And and the one interesting thing that seemed to 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 come out of this is that uh, the the second most common predator was a was a, the the black rat snake. Um, and uh, so these snakes they move through the vegetation. Uh, they will, um, it's also the black racer, and I, I wasn't always able to actually tell which one is which in my camera, in, in my video, but they will move through the vegetation, and, it, and they can only do this if the vegetation is sufficiently dense. Mm -hmm. On the edge of the forest, there's more light, so you can get denser vegetation. There's just more light hitting, you know, there's no, the trees are only on one side, so the light can come in. You can get this very mm -hmm. dense, mostly invasive vegetation, and the snakes can move through it. Uh, so that, that that's one one uh, thing we're, we're seeing that's um, kind of easy to 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 explain. It's simply uh, if you're on the edge, a snake is a, more likely to get to your nest and do so safely for the snake. Um, and but really, the number one predator or the number one I'll refer to as a predator is the parasitic cowbird, and this mm -hmm. is the songbird that is. Um, uh, as a brood parasite, uh, but its effect on nests, especially cardinal nests, tends to be uh, uh, predatory, as in the nest will fail uh, uh, um, as a response to the cowbirds, those, those birds disturbing the cardinal eggs or, or destroying them. Um, now, the cowbird, uh, I teach, I do two lectures on, on the cowbird um, and other brood parasites. Uh, we don't have time for that to get into all that information, but just to give you the general idea, this is a bird that does not um, build its own nest. These are brown-headed cowbirds, by the way, but there's other species of cowbirds and they behave very similarly. Uh, they don't build their own nest. So what they do instead, they go to a songbird nest, another songbird, like the cardinal, like a chipping sparrow. Many species can get parasitized like this. It will remove an egg and replace uh, uh, an egg with with their own egg. So the cowbird will come uh, and uh, will will keep tabs on nest in the area. Will choose a nest, put its egg in there, remove uh, the uh, one of the host eggs, so one of the cardinal's eggs in this example, and might do that several times. And the cardinal will end up um, raising the cowbird egg, the cowbird mm -hmm. young. And that's called the brood parasite. Mm -hmm. Obviously, how this is a form of parasitism, um, but yeah. many times the cardinals will simply uh, uh, abandon their nest. While uh, presumably, when they figure out that something fishy is going on, so all that effort goes 
you know, is squandered and now the mm -hmm. cardinal has to build a new nest. So that effect is, is in a way predatory. Uh, so we consider them predators. Yeah. It's very creative when you think of it from an evolutionary standpoint oh, of, of like, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't have the time or energy to raise my own young, so I'm going to sneak it into that nest and you can do it. Yeah. And I mean, just um, there's a lot of hypotheses. Yeah. I encourage anybody to read about it. It's quite uh, in intriguing. Yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating. Well, I, wanna, I have a question I was going to ask later, but based on what you were talking about with the northern cardinal and and how different part, ways the urban landscape can affect the success of their nesting. Um, I know a lot of people that are tuning in have this kind of general question that I that I, I hope I'm giving appropriate voice to. Um, so if you live in an urban area, if you're a homeowner, apartment, renter, anything like that, how can what can we do to help make the landscape more bird friendly and, and more able to support things like the northern cardinal and um, I don't know. Is there uh, anything we're not doing that yeah. we can do better? That kind of thing. Yeah. So um, th this is again going to be a complex answer, but I'll try to keep it short. Uh, uh, so, so in the urban area, the landscape is already modified, and there's some species you won't be able to get back that were there before. One species, and again, you can look up these species. The the wood thrush used to be quite common. This is a forest bird. It is. It, its call, its song is synonymous for a lot of old people with their childhood. Mm -hmm. uh, the wood thrush is no longer, um, uh, I think I think the population dropped by roughly 90% in, in wow. the past uh, century. Um, and uh, it's no longer common. And it, yeah, it depends on, on, having, uh, on um, having a, a, a large, fairly large forest. It can do okay in medium sized forest patches, but uh, Anyway, that's me saying, if you're living in an urban area, especially closer to the city center, you, you won't get those species there. For, but for the uh, for the species that are around, so the gray catbird, the northern cardinal, the song sparrow, the northern mockingbird in some more open areas, uh, many, many species that those these these eastern uh, east coast yard birds, uh, what what can you do? So we, we, we can think of the winter when, when uh, resources are, are quite scarce. Uh, putting out bird feeders is, is a tradition, a, a real American tradition. Uh, again, Native Americans uh, uh, have, have done this also. Um, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting, uh, um, has, has an interesting history, but uh, it is considered perfectly uh, fine. It's not like you go to, I don't know, some, uh, to Florida where totally don't feed the alligators. We don't yeah. regard those <laughs> as the same thing. Uh, it's generally considered uh, positive and putting out seeds in the winter will attract many seed eating birds like the Northern Cardinal. Um, and it allows to essentially say, at least philosophically to say, okay, we're in an urban area. We removed a lot of the forest, a lot of the resources. Uh, we maybe planted some plants, but you know, there's still quite a scarcity maybe of resources. Here, I'm going to compensate a little bit. I'm going to bring some resources from the field somewhere, wherever it is, wherever, wherever I grow uh, black sun, sunflower uh, plants, bring those resources into the city. Okay, and that uh, really, I think the greatest benefit of it is that people can actually see and connect to these animals. That's valuable. But if I had to, to choose two, two things, I, I would just go with the numbers, what we know. Uh, so I'll start with the most important thing you can do if you are a, a cat, a, a pet owner, specifically a cat owner. Uh, I, I love cats. Uh, it's not about liking them or not liking them, but letting them out is probably the worst thing you can do, uh, letting them roam. Uh, worst thing you, you can do, um, to songbirds and specifically, uh, and more generally to, to wildlife. This will include um, amphibians and, and reptiles as well. They, uh, everybody likes saying, no, my cat is different. It's amazing how everybody says it, yet the numbers are still the numbers. So it is, um, it, it's a funny thing. Uh, the, the, the number of, of wild animals that feral and sponsored cats, let's say cats that live in the house and we let out, or we kind of feed 
uh, or maybe we only vaccinate them or whatever, but they're street cats. The number of, of wild animals, native animals that they kill is too large to mention because once you mention it, people don't want to believe it. It's that bad. Okay, so we're talking about several billions. Mm, wow. The yeah. lowest estimate I, I think I saw, and and um, there's articles on it, um, you know, feel, feel free to look it up and correct this number, but the smallest number might be higher. The smallest number I've seen as an estimate is a billion and a half. Uh, the more accepted ones, um, somewhere between two and three billion. We're talking about birds. We're talking about lizards. Um, we're talking about frogs. Cats. It's what they, it's what they do. It, it's it, I'm not you know obviously this is not a, you know, there's no need to to blame or hate an animal. Not like that at all. I love cats, um, but letting them out is hyper destructive. That's a number one after habitat destruction. By the way, which is a general category, um, the biggest destroyer killer of songbirds and more generally native wildlife are sponsored cats that's just the way it is it could be some of them are feral sorry feral and sponsored so these house cats we bring brought them in they they don't belong in this ecosystem we when i say sponsor i mean we we either directly give them food and shelter or we vaccinate them and then they leave or we simply have human infrastructure that supports them maybe they maybe they're a feral cat but you know they live under a shed somewhere i don't know what mm -hmm. uh, they yeah, and, and uh, the predators that would bring balance to this, okay, the 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 um, coyotes and the wolves and uh, larger cats, uh, they are scarce because of human activity. So you know, if humans disappear tomorrow, what would li would likely happen to cats? To these feral cats, probably within several generations, they would disappear altogether. Uh, that's mm. I, I I did ask. Uh, the researcher, the main, uh, the non-researcher on this topic, and that was our consensus. Uh, they probably, truly, are supported by humans directly or not, and and they're causing all this destruction. That's probably the biggest thing. The second thing you can do is if you you have, um, if you live in a house where you get window strikes, birds hitting windows, mm -hmm. you can uh, look into simply uh, uh, modifying those windows a little bit. We could talk. We we're talking about stickers or something in the window it has to be done right. It's not too expensive, and you can you can put little uh, these little uh, stickers on the window, and the birds won't hit them or will hit them much less likely to hit them. And when we're talking about window collisions in North America, sorry, and in the U.S. alone, we're talking about billion a billion birds dying a year. That's a that's a, again a bit a big number. Um, but we can do something about it if we know. Mm -hmm. it, Usually it is the case that people go, they look, they see a dead bird by a window and they think it's a, it's a fluke, you know, oh, that's so tragic. I'm a lucky bird. It's actually a huge phenomenon because windows are transparent, but they also, also are reflective. And they're also, we like, you know, we like vegetation to be close to the window. So we get all these reflection, reflections. And uh, so it's a big deal for birds. Other than that, you know, having, a, uh, if you have a garden, you know, putting shrubs and trees, working on the vegetation structure complexity, having uh, 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 planting shrubs that produce uh, berries that birds might enjoy, putting nest boxes around for bluebirds or, or tree swallows if you have those around, or, um, uh, or or woodpeckers. Those are nice things that are certainly ben beneficial. And the last thing I'd say, if you do have a lot of land or some input, don't cut down dying or dead trees unless they are really are a severe danger, of course. Uh, uh, snags, okay, so these are dead or dying trees, are extremely important for many animals, um, and especially uh, for uh, several species of songbirds that we enjoy, like uh, like woodpeckers, chickadees, uh, titmice. Uh, so you know, the dying trees, that's a bunch of energy and resources that's, that are sitting there. Don't, don't cut them down leave them there they're a part of the forest um unless it's, obviously if it's a real danger then you don't, don't want it to fall on anybody um that's a, another example yeah we had a question from uh laura one of our listeners about um the impact of wind turbines i know that like in the in the environmental world that's a, often an area yeah. of discussion um 
how do wind, I don't know if you have like the numbers on this, but how do wind turbines kind of level up in terms of, or down, I guess, in terms yeah. of like cats and yeah. environmental fragmentation yeah, we do, and things like that? We do have the data on this. Uh, first, wind turbines are, are dangerous for uh, for birds, soaring birds, um, and also for bats. But when you look at the numbers, we're talking uh, two to, um, what is it? Uh, so, two to three orders of magnitude less of a danger. So compared to okay. cats, wind turbines, uh, electric lines, I don't remember, there's a list here of, um, I don't have in front of me, of the dangers, wind turbines mm -hmm. are way low. Uh, controlling our, our, our cats and, you know, you forget about that. That seems to be just so, uh, there's so much resistance to it. <laughs> Protecting <laughs> our windows. Yeah. When, when we're building the building, put in windows that are, yeah. You know, save your own energy and and save the birds that you're going to make um so much a, such a, a larger effect than than uh, thinking of the, the the wind turbines if we're simply considering the numbers that's not to say that we don't know we don't want to work on the wind turbine issue it's just uh the the numbers are so much lower yeah oh, that's good to, thanks for putting that into perspective um because i i've gotten that question a lot um I think if there's one slogan takeaway from our conversation, it's indoor cats are bird loving cats or something like that. Um, just to kind of lean it. I mean, I, I get it because when I was growing up, um, we had we called them gopher cats because I was living in California and they hunted yeah. gophers. Um, uh -huh. But you're right. They would they would bring us like a bird, you know, as like, oh, look what I found. Um, and so now, as an adult, all my cats are indoor cats now. I don't have to. Have to yeah, deal yeah. with any of that. I don't want yeah. to see any of that. So, yeah, I, I think. Right. I know good... with some cats it's hard. They really want to be outside. I they do. <laughs> I had a cat like that in the past. Yeah. yeah. Um. Before I ask you, I was going to ask you about the mercury pollution. Um. But before I do, I want to make sure anyone who's listening knows. Um. Please feel free to ask questions in the chat, and I'll try to make sure we get to them. So I'll keep my my next question about mercury pollution rather short. Um, and then too, I'll make sure we have some time to share some of the links we were talking about before um, before we got started. We were talking about um, all about birds through the Cornell Lab and eBird, and I'll share some of those in our chat in a second. But I want to make sure we have time. So I also understand that songbirds are susceptible to methyl mercury pollution. And I found this quite fascinating because when I studied oceanography, we hear all about methyl mercury in the ocean and and the fish that it can accumulate in and and the very famous Minamata disease associated with it. So I was surprised to I hadn't really thought about birds being exposed to it. Can you tell us how how do songbirds even get exposed to mercury? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so as you mentioned, being exposed to mercury from uh, the ocean, if you were an ocean bird, maybe it wouldn't be as surprising. But songbirds, uh, almost all of them, are, are, are terrestrial birds. So how do they get the mercury? We we uh, we think of mercury as a as as a pollutant that gets into water, goes downhill, gets into a river, or dumped into a river or the ocean. And uh, so how does it get out? Uh, first, uh, by the way, mercury. Uh, I would say it's uh, it, a methyl mercury specifically. It, it's not only that songbirds are sensitive to it. Uh, I would say almost any organism would be sensitive to it. It's a neurotoxin, but why does it appear in high levels in some areas in songbirds? Well, uh, one, one, let's take an example from West Virginia and Virginia. The, uh, in the past, in the early 20th century, uh, there were factories that dumped a whole bunch of, of mercury into water. They didn't know what to do with it. They were negligent, they were criminal, and they're, they're paying for it uh, now. Uh, and it goes into the sediment, and it, it it's converted there into this methyl mercury, which is a nasty toxin, uh, neurotoxin. And to get out of out of the water, there were all kinds of hypotheses. You know, maybe maybe uh, 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 some fish eating bird will catch a fish, will eat it, will get uh, um, the toxin in its body, and you know might uh, poop it out on land, and and that's how we'll get into land. All these things they happen. It's not the real reason. That's not the major reason, uh, the major mechanism with which mercury moves into terrestrial areas. The, the major mechanism is actually uh, simply uh, sediment being picked up 
as there are floods in the rivers. Okay, it's a simply mechanical process where a lot of water will move into the river when there's a lot of rain or something like that. And, and you know, it will flood the forest and then retreat. It floods the forest, the sediment sinks into the forest floor, and then the water retreats back. Okay, so that's the sediment being disturbed with it, with this methylmercury is accumulated in huge concentrations, very high concentrations. That gets disturbed, there's a flood, gets into the forest, dumps that sediment there. Once it's in the forest, what how does it get into the bird? Well, what happens in forests, all these organisms are connected, the trees, the insects, the birds, so forth, and, uh, and the microorganisms. Uh, what we simply see is that we have uh, a whole, we, we call it nowadays food web, we call it a, a food chain for simplicity, for you know, kind of unidimensionality. Uh, we have uh, an insect eating microorganisms, eating whatever it is that has a, a small amount of mercury in it, but a predator eating that insect and accumulating more mercury in its body, and a bigger insect eating that insect, and so forth. And that's called biomagnification as you move up the food chain or the food web, you'll get these toxins accumulating in a higher and higher concentration from concentrations from a from a, um, a herbivore into a top predator. And the reason is is when these neurotoxins, especially methylmercury, with many of these neurotoxins, they're bioaccumulative. That is to say, uh, mostly in many cases, the the um, an organism that will eat a certain concentration cannot uh, actually uh, uh, excrete out of its body the toxin at the same rate that it's consuming it. Okay, so okay. it excretes at a lower rate, so it will accumulate, and then the predator will eat that, and now its food source it has even more mercury, so it will just go up and up. And in the insect community, the top predators are, you might know, spiders. Mm. So spiders in these forests, these contaminated forests, have a lot of methylmercury in them. And it so happens to be, sadly, that songbirds just love spiders. They love eating spiders and other insects too, but they, uh, we're seeing evidence that they prefer spiders over other prey species. Uh, so now you can imagine uh, songbirds having a significant part of their diet being a highly uh, contaminated um, uh, food item of spiders. And uh, so it moved from the river, from the sediment into the soil of the forest. The entire food web does what it does there. The songbird as a predator, uh, especially in the summer when it feeds its young a lot of protein, it will catch these spiders and other insects as well. And it, they are just uh, contaminated. And then they feed their babies uh, a neurotoxin, essentially, and those babies uh, have problems developing. And that's what I studied, say the effects on development with a diet that is um that is uh this was a lab, lab experiment but a diet that is um similar to that that we see in some areas of virginia around the, the point source contamination historical one did the did the babies not live to adulthood or did they did they still make it to adulthood they just i mean i guess in what it's all of the above. It's just it was bad in general. We're talking, okay. yeah, we're 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 talking about a, a neurotoxin that also has effects, complex effects on on protein in general. Uh, so once once you're talking about about the, the this large um, molecule, okay, or or this large uh, let's call it a molecule, uh, mercury attaching itself to any protein, almost any protein, especially the, the certain kinds of amino acids. Those are all throughout the body, and you can expect you can expect effects that are just throughout the 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 uh, the system. Okay, neurological, mm -hmm. uh, enzymatic, uh, in, any internal organ uh, functioning, uh, muscles. You can, and that's what we see. We see some uh, some young not making it at all, not even hatching out of the egg. Others reaching adulthood, but with deficits. And I also um, in my master's quantified some of these deficits um, so um yeah and it's uh, so we're talking about virginia but really we, we're seeing mercury contamination in many regions in, in the world um and where regulation is poor and where gold mining or gold extraction and regulation is poor those those issues could be really bad um and hmm. uh, cynically bad in many cases as well we're just ignoring a, a clear issue 
Um, we, we don't we don't have time to get into the gold mining uh, stuff, but I um, anybody can look up the connection between uh, uh, gold mining and mercury contamination. Hmm. So um, yeah, it's it's an issue uh, that we see uh, nowadays close to us here in Central and South America. A lot of gold extraction using mercury and a lot of uh, issues and you know. Um, it, it's it's sad. There are things we can do about it, though. And in many places, it is getting better. Uh, certainly, in in uh, in the nations that have uh, good um, regulations and enforcement and communication, even in education systems. Yeah, that sounds. Yeah, I was think, I was thinking. It sounds like the solution is really um being more proactive with the regulate the environmental policy and regulation side of things and a shout out to our graduate students that are taking environmental policy this summer and learning all about um how that can be used as a tool to help prevent things yeah, like this a lot from to, happening to talk about yeah and you know a lot of areas poor people they just want to have to make money somehow mm -hmm. and, and and gold is an amazing source of income but it's it's tragic at the same time because the only way for them to actually make sense financially is to use mercury to extract those tiny gold particles and yikes. yeah yikes <laughs> um we had a good question from stewart i want to make sure i have time to ask that uh living close to lock raven i have many birds coming to visit my property and i have several plants that help sustain them when they land on the pool cover and eat little things that have landed on the cover, I worry that some of the pool chemicals are entering the bird's system. Um, he mentions they're not actively drinking pool water, but is this harming them? But I'm also curious too, is I, I have, I live on Ken Island and I I have a lot of waterfowl that will, like ducks that'll come and swim in my pool and I see them drinking the water too. So I'm, I'm curious yeah. <laughs> in terms of even drinking the pool water, how how worried should we be if we see birds in and around just these pool systems that we have? Yeah, the thing with toxicology is that you really you have to know every chemical effect yeah. out of the body. I, I can tell one thing about ducks specifically. They, especially mallards, we know a lot. They are robust. They they are they can take a lot of chemical abuse, and they do, um, and they seem to be uh, able to. Uh, uh, feel fewer of the effects compared to other birds. Yeah, but but uh, those chemicals, the chlorine, the hypochlorite, I believe it's called. Um, I haven't seen any uh, significant literature about it. It can't be good. I won't say that. Mm -hmm. um, but is it a known issue for songbirds? Uh, I have not heard that. That doesn't mean that it, that it isn't. Um, Luckily, with, with those compounds, they do break down quite quickly, unlike heavy metals that might, that don't. Uh, so, yeah, I I I do not know uh, uh, specifically about them even drinking the water. I uh, I can't I I can't tell you much except that it uh, not, is not considered a, a, an issue that is. Uh, not coming up uh, in the literature as anything uh, consequential, as far as I could tell. Yeah. Okay, so it sounds like uh, it's probably okay, but yeah, there might be a potential area for future bird ecology research too. Um, I know we're getting really close to two o'clock, so I don't want to hold too long, but I wanted to point out some resources that you had mentioned to me, Ohad, that I shared in the chat. So I shared the, the link for All About Birds and also the link for ebird.org. Um, do you want to give a, just a brief mention as to what what these are good resources for? Yeah, so so we have so so with eBird, let's start with that. Uh, it is a resource uh, for well, it's a way of of uh, of systematically logging your bird uh, observations. If you are a birder or if you're trying to get into it, uh, one thing exciting that a lot of times that sometimes will happen is that you will see uh, a bird that you did not expect. Or you would see a bird where you would expect it to, but it's such a rare bird that it's a, you would feel that it is a, important to mention it. A lot of people just log their entire day of observation into eBird. But I know I've used eBird to see, to kind of see where, where I might expect to find uh, one species or another. So with, with eBird, it, it, it's a, it's a large, data, large data set you can contribute to by logging in. 
your birding uh, observations. Ideally, you do that consistently, uh, obviously without bias um, and systematically. It, it, it is a, a little bit rigorous, uh, but people really enjoy that and they go and, and they uh, look at other people's observations and they will go and try to find that bird as well. So it has a competitive and also a community element to it. And as I said, scientists use that data. Then if you just want to learn about birds, um, there are many nice resources. Uh, allaboutbirds.org, um, which is associated with the uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, can give you a lot of nice information. Audubon as well. Um, uh, you will see there are a lot of pictures, a lot of nice information. You can also um, pay for a, a, a sub sub uh, subscription for Birds of the World. Uh, that goes to uh, charity uh, and actually learn a whole bunch about any species um, and, um, and Eddie, yeah, there, there are many other resources online to learn about birds uh, luckily mm -hmm. people are really interested uh, so I was, gonna, I was gonna say Eddie mentioned the Merlin app which I know we had yeah, talked about too I I use that a lot to identify birds by sound I think that's very helpful yeah. so yeah, I think this is wonderful. Thank you for sharing these great resources and for the the conversation too about it's so. I mean, I, the problems facing songbirds, but also some of the what can we do because I feel like there's a lot of passion here in terms of what can we do to make it better. Um, and since we're just past two o'clock, I don't want to hold anyone too long. So thank you so much, Ohad, for our conversation today. Thank you everyone for joining. And just one final reminder, I will send out the recording of this probably by tomorrow. So if you uh, didn't get to hear all of it or anything like Should that, you can. Thing? Oh, yeah, right ahead. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the summary point, potentially. I would say just connect, uh, connect others. There's something really just different and, and, and mysterious uh, about birds. And if you open somebody else's eyes to it, they'll become... I found people just become uh, conscientious. They become what's that world a word? Would you kind of experience the, the world almost like a tourist? Um, uh, mindful, whatever it is. And there's something, and then you'll notice it's surrounding you all day long. And it's a real gift. I I find many people really get hooked because they find a lot of um, stories and mystery and intrigue out there all around them where they never saw it before. So if you can just connect to wildlife, to birds or to any other wildlife and give that gift to somebody else, we already will be uh, in a more, I would say, uh, open-minded uh, and, and a loving place where we might uh, make a, a, a more um, community-based, global-based, uh, uh, bring benefit in that way to, um, to biodiversity in our world. I think so that's that, a that's a wonderful takeaway. And I think I'm guessing that the word you're maybe looking for is awe, that sense of awe. I'm, yeah, maybe, you know, <laughs> you know, maybe just mindfulness is the one. Mindfulness. The okay. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ahad. And um, yeah, I guess stay tuned, you guys, for future seminars. But thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everybody.